So, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, my pleasure to talk about LiFi today, and um, I'd like to walk you through a little bit the theory behind the applications, but also what it means in a commercial context. And uh, what we try to do with LiFi is transform the capacities that we have heard exist in the fiber optic domain into the wireless domain. So uh, in order to do that, we need to appreciate and say, what have we done in wireless to date? So far, we have been using the radio frequency spectrum. And what I've shown you here is the, the radio frequency spectrum map of the United States. It's the entire radio spectrum from 0 to 300 gigahertz. And uh, that is OK, but I don't want you to, to see all these patches that you see there, but I want to recognize that you notice that the RF spectrum is pretty occupied by various wireless applications. And if we listen to Jeremy Rifkin, uh, who recently introduced the third industrial revolution that we are in now, we are living in, data -centric, in a data-centric societies where economies grow on data, as opposed to the second industrial revolution, obviously, which is where we've grown from a sort of fossil energy heavy industries. And this here is a, certainly the equivalent of the previous oil wells that have driven the third industrial revolution. But the important message here is it's, it's really limited. It's confined, it's restricted, and it's, it's at 300 gigahertz, it's, it's the end. If we look at mobile communication systems, what we have noticed is that um, in, in early days, they started in the uh, sort of uh, 900 megahertz region. We went to the third generation systems. They went up into the two gigahertz regions, the three gigahertz region, and the fourth generation into, into four, three and uh, four gigahertz. But now, if you listen to what's going on in the uh, context of the fifth generation of mobile communications, they talk about millimeter wave communication. And obviously, these are the frequencies above um, 30 gigahertz. Uh, this is the last band that you see on the slide here. And this is basically the last resort, the last resource to, do, to, to provide wireless services. But if you believe there is lots of available spectrum there, what it tells us, it's fairly limited. So the question really when I started this research 15 years ago is, um, how, do we, how do we make sure that our wireless uh, services um, all around augmented reality, virtual reality will survive uh, the future and make us future-proof. The important uh, sort of uh, realization is also, if we go to higher frequency bands, there's something that's called the freeze, uh, free space equation, and it tells us that the path loss uh, measured with L here is proportional to the, the square of the frequency. So if we go through, uh, for example, our current Wi-Fi systems, with, which live in the 2 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz uh, band, so if you take 3 gigahertz as an example and move that up into the uh, 60 gigahertz region, which is what's currently YGIG using, is what it, it incurs is an additional path loss of a factor of 400 or 26 dB. So in order to cover the same distance, you would need to have 400 times higher power but given the previous talk is we don't want to waste energy, so that's not an option. So the only option is to have beamforming, but with beamforming you wouldn't have ubiquitous coverage and you would need to have very complex um, um, rate tracing uh, techniques. And I, I wanted to visualize that, that power increase here by a little sort of bar graphic. It, this is, if this is the power that you would need uh, at 300, uh, uh, 3 gigahertz, then the, the, this yellow bar would be sort of the, the power you would need in, in millimeter wave systems. And again, th that, is, that is a problem that it currently exists in mobile communications, in particular in the uplink. And there's another trend that is very important. Uh, so far, we humans have used the internet primarily via social media, social networking. Uh, but that, that trend is being superseded in the future by the internet of things. And the Internet of Things is very important uh, to uh, save energy and to make our environments more intelligent. We see the trend of artificial intelligence. We see the trend of drones, autonomous drones. We see the trend of autonomous cars. And all of these objects around us will somehow link to the Internet. And we 
some people predict 80 billion new devices by 2024. And if you go to the industry, they even talk about 100 billion new devices that are connected to the internet. So if you then say we have a limited resource to transmit data, we want to have more data on our smartphones, and we want to have these 100 billion devices, it, it ends up in a big, big problem. And uh, the, the problem is sort of uh, exacerbated or, or shown here is that with this new wave of uh, sort of um, intelligence and autonomous systems, uh, I've broken it down into sort of the, the, the core building blocks that we need in order to create intelligent environments. Call it simply a smart X, smart environment, smart home, and so on. And this is an environment we want to control with future systems. And what are the key components of these uh, um, um, controlling uh, systems? Obviously, what, what is very important is we need sensors, like we humans have sensors with uh, touches uh, as a visual sensor. We need to, the, the intelligent systems need to uh, visualize and, and sense the environment. And then the sensing data, it, it may happen at a wing of an aircraft, or it may happen in, the, in, a, in a remote area. Um, the data need to be brought to a central processor, the brain of the future smart systems. And the, uh, there's the nervous system, system which is the connectivity that is providing the data to the central processor. And the information need to be processed. And then we have this issue about big data. So we have lots of information, lots of data gathered. We need data analytics. And from the data analytics, we need to have smart applications that then extract information to react to the, back to the system and control the environment. And this is a feedback loop, it's a closed loop. And obviously, if we think about uh, the, the green box here as our future smart system, we don't want to charge our smart system in the future like we do with our smartphones every evening. It needs to be energy autonomous. So energy harvesting comes in as well. So these are fundamental questions. And uh, what I wanted to show is we can talk about big data. We can talk about uh, artificial intelligence. We can talk about all of these trends. But there is a, a necessary requirement, which is connectivity. It's not sufficient to only have connectivity, but it's necessary. And the real question is, how, how do we ensure that we have ubiquitous high-speed connect connectivity in for these future systems? Um, so the, the first recognition is, um, is, is trivial. Um, I've told you about the radio spectrum. Obviously, it's, it's, it's part of the electromagnetic spectrum, as is light and infrared and ultraviolet light. And even X-rays and gamma rays uh, may be considered for future communication systems. But the important message is the, the, the limitations that I've tried to highlight earlier doesn't really exist in a physical world because we have a 2,600 times more bandwidth in the infrared and the visible light region. Um, we, haven't, we have made use of that bandwidth in the fiber optics domain, but in a wireless domain, we haven't really. Uh, and that is a, a lost opportunity, I think, that will change with Li-Fi. So important components in order to uh, fulfill these requirements of ubiquitous high-speed coverage is LED sources, as we've learned. The, the light process is not by heat. It's by uh, um, quantum processes on, on, a, on a silicon device or on a, on a photonic device. The same is with, with photo uh, um, PV of, uh, f um, cell, um, uh, solar cells. Uh, these are detectors that capture photons, and they obviously harvest energies, uh, energy at the moment. So that has led to a demonstration here at TED Global. What we've done here, we've taken an, an IKEA lamp, have put in an, an, a very cheap $3 LED lamp, and in a gray box that you see here on the, on the right-hand graph, is lots of signal processing, FEGA boards, power supplies, and this lamp has transmitted at um, sort of high speeds, high definition video through that link that, that, that is shown there. And the principle is very simple. We have uh, data content somewhere, and then we have uh, data content either through the power lines that connect our lights or power over ethernet, connect into the driver, which is electronics anyway for the LED, and then modify or change the intensity, uh, it's simple on-off keying. Detector, we can use uh, photo cells uh, or, or solar cells. We can use normal detectors like avalanche diodes or pin diodes, 
Recently, we have looked into single photon avalanche diodes, so single photon detectors, which are very, uh, very promising receiver technology as well. We capture the signal, decode it, and then we, have, we want it back. And that's, that's a simplex communication link. Obviously, we don't use on-off keying, because on-off keying is hugely um, um, bandwidth inefficient. So we use a form of uh, multi-level uh, coding, but not only that, we also uh, use multi-channel um, multi coding. So we use a form of OFDM, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, to achieve very high data rates. So that's on the transmitter side. On the receiver side, what we've demonstrated here last year is take an off-the-shelf LED lamp and then have a solar cell on the, on the um, left-hand side here. And uh, what we've done is, and you may see this, this laptop in the back here, where you see some clouds. We have sort of transmitted a high-definition video to that off-the-shelf unmodified solar cell at a speed of um, up to 15 megabit per second. Uh, and what we've obviously done is some added some electronics at the output of the, the solar cell, some equalization to recover the signals and, and shape the signal. But it is possible with solar cells to receive very high data rates, and it's yet not modified. So we have now a number of projects where we look at enhancing the data rate from a solar cell. So the, the, the principle is, is very clear. You have your smartphone or you have your future Internet of Things device. It, it needs to be powered you could uh, use the ambient light or the uh, light uh, from, from outside in order to power the device, so it's energy harvesting. And then you can turn on the switch, and you vary the intensity of the light source, and that intensity variation also transmits data. In that case here, you have uh, sort of a high-speed data stream uh, transmitted through the smartphone, which is a representative of any future IoT device. So that brings me to, to uh, the data rates, and that's something that we've been looking at for, for, for years, and uh, we've seen a, a basically a dramatic increase of data rates from off-the-shelf LEDs. Um, if you take the phosphorus-coated white LED, it's limited by the slowing by the phosphorus layer on top of the blue chip, and the maximum data rates we can get from these is, is in the region of, uh, of about uh, 100 megabit per second. That's what, with, with the best and optimal modulation techniques, is what you can get. But if you go to more advanced RGB LEDs, um, you have e, you have, uh, a, you have uh, three channels, and you don't have the phosphorus uh, coding on top, and that would allow you to get approximately five gigabit per second, which is in the, in the, in the, um, in the area of, of wireless gigabits, so Y gig, uh, so the latest Wi-Fi standard. So with my colleagues, uh, uh, Martin Dawson in, in Strathclyde, uh, he's, he's pioneered the gallium nitride micro-LEDs for display applications and many other applications. But uh, the, the size of these micro-LEDs is small, so the capacitance is small, and therefore the, uh, the, the, um, the channel transfer function is also fairly, fairly large. And in, in a recent uh, experiment, I think that is the, the record speeds that is, have shown is 10 gigabit from a single violet uh, gallium nitride micro-LED um, with, without uh, sort of uh, any additional devices, single device, single wave, uh, sort of single uh, spectral emission profile. Um, we are now reaching status, a status where the transmission speed is not limited by the actual LED device anymore. It's now the detector that limits uh, the, the performance. And in a, 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 an experiment that uh, we've recently conducted as well is we've taken red, green, blue laser, have uh, combined it into a wide light beam with a diffuser as a way to where we see the future lighting industry is going into laser-based illumination. And with lasers, you have a bandwidth of uh, one gigahertz and more. And with that uh, system, it is possible and conceivable that uh, you have 100 gigabit wirelessly transmitted over a fairly large distance. So at the, the LIFI R&D Center, um, and also it's part of a, a, a large multi-million research project in the UK with partners from Oxford, uh, St. Andrews, uh, Cambridge, um, and um, in Edinburgh, and Strathclyde, we have developed the first LIFI chips here. What you see on the, the left-hand side here is a, um, a 49 um, element um, APD chip on CMOS. 
So these are APDs on CMOS at an APD gain each on around 10 dB, and the bandwidth is about 100 megahertz. On the right-hand side, uh, we see the first Li-Fi driver chip that can drive up to four channels at, at a current of each channel of 250 milliamps and 550, uh, 500 uh, megahertz bandwidth. So the total system that you see here can drive uh, up to one, one megahertz. What we have also done here, and uh, I'm hoping to get this running here, is we have opened up the transmitter chip that you see here and have wire bonded an array of 16 micro LEDs on top of the driver chip. And what we are able to do is we can now control each of the single um, uh, micro LED in that array that um, would allow us to then apply methods like uh, MIMO, multiple input, multiple output, but also we can use that to have a, on, a light-based digital-to-analog converter um, with, with that kind of, of uh, sort of structure, so various experiments that have been conducted. And, and also this could be a chip that could be integrated into very small devices, variables, which uh, forms a sort of a IoT device. So the, the idea is, um, in, in, in the past I told you about the, the, the 10 gigabit, some, some earlier results uh, with a single uh, sort of 5 milliwatt optical output power micro LED pixel where we have transmitted, as you see here, um, data rates of up to 3 gigabit per second at a bit error performance in the region of 1 uh, to the power of minus 3, so 1 out of 1,000 uh, um, bits was corrupted. And, and the, the scheme that we use, you see here, this is the transfer function, and then what we apply is, depending on the, the state of the channel, we apply different higher order level modulation. So from 8 bits to 7, 6, and so on, we, we change the uh, constellation size of the, the quadrature amplitude modulation uh, symbol depending on the channel. And also within a group of uh, modulation schemes, we change the power in order to ensure that we have bit and power loading optimized. So the, the experiment with the laser um, light bulb um, is shown here. It's, again, a construction of three lasers, a diffuser, and um, with, with, a, with a three laser system, we have, done, we have achieved here 15 gigabit per second. But if you would scale it up to, uh, in, in total, um, you have the, the three system here. And um, if you had 98, uh, 89 devices per color, you would have um, an illuminance of about 800 lux, which is what you have in lighting these days. But if you would use not only three colors, if you use 36 colors, for example, using quantum dots or some other narrowband emission systems, and uh, scale up the number of devices, uh, create an illuminance, again, in the region of 1,000 looks, then this could reach up to 100 gigabit per second wirelessly through a light bulb that illuminates a square meter and, and more. So there's one big misconception is that LIFI is the line of sight technology. So here you see one equipment that we've developed in pure LIFI. Is, this is an off-the-shelf downlighter. We have a, a modem here. That, that modem here is connected to the USB channel, and it receives the, the video that you see here. So we turn around it. There's adaptive modulation encoding kicking in now. That's a, therefore, you see a little interruption. But now, despite the fact you don't have any direct line of sight transmission anymore, it's all off the reflected wall, the video is still showing up. So Li-Fi is not, by default, a line of sight technology. So in other words, if you have an aircraft and you have a, a down so an overhead light and then you want to control a sensor beneath the seat, that is possible because of the, the, uh, the multipath reflections from the environment. And it's all a matter about the signal-to-noise ratio that you get into the receiver and uh, the modulation schemes scale the data rate based on the SINR. And in, in a typical room environment where you have uh, a minimum of eight, uh, 500 looks, that is what you need for reading levels, um, then you, this would translate into an SINR between 40 and 70 dB. In typical wireless system, you have about 15, 20 dB, but you have really large SINRs, which we exploit via this uh, sort of adaptive modulation coding systems. So we have done another experiment here um, in, in the lab. What you see here is, and you will see a soon a video, we have a single pixel of a, a gallium nitride micro LED array here at 5 milliwatt optical output power. Uh, we have normal ambient light conditions, so it's not in a dark room environment. Uh, what we transmit here is over 10 meter, um, a data rate of 1.1 gigabit per second, 
we have an, an um, optical receiver here, an APD, that we've uh, got from our colleagues in Oxford. And, and then we receive the signal and put it into a national instrument, PXI, where all the physical layer sort of encoding, decoding, and encoding is, is contained. And what we show here is the uh, high definition video at, at the receiver. And uh, I have a little video that shows that system. So this is the, the micro LED array, and um, you see the data cable coming in here. That is um, also modern engineering with Bluetack. So this is the pixel here. It's five milliwatt optical output power. And uh, with, uh, at the um, receiver, we have some collimation here. And then the, the, the cylinder here is the, the APD. Um, and that, that takes the analog signal. And that is, that is the video that's, that's transmitted through that link. So we obviously run it at the, the limit. So we can block it, and it would, would stop. Um, in that case, not, not enough photons come into the receiver. And now we unplug it, and the video comes back up again. So it, it, if you imagine it's your fridge that has a little blue light, a status light, um, it's possible now to, to use that to transmit data out of the fridge. Sort of, uh, you can monitor real time the growth of your mold in the, in the fridge to, to, the, to the system, so at, at, at high definition video quality. That, that, that kind of uh, not sensible application is, is possible. But this, this, this additional, additional misconceptions is that I've been always asked is what about sunlight, what about ambient light? So in order to prove the point, uh, first of all, OFDM works on a DC signal only. All DC ambient light, like sunlight, is a constant signal, which we usually filter out at the receiver. So what we've done here is we have to wait uh, four years uh, to get strong sun in, in uh, Scotland, which is uh, a sun-deprived area, so no, no problems about cooling there. It's, it's the other way around. So nonetheless, we got a day with strong sunlight, and we used a mirror that you see in the experiment here, and basically reflected all the sunlight into the receiver. And in parallel, there was an, um, a micro-LED link ongoing um, that you may, may see there. And uh, the, the, the bright spot is the, the uh, sort of reflected sunlight into the receiver. And we wanted to understand uh, what is the impact on the data rate. And I think there's, uh, we've used two different detectors of uh, size 19.6 uh, square millimeter and a much smaller detector of 0.19 square millimeter and have looked into the degradation of data rates because of this strong sunlight um, uh, coming into the detector. And um, let's go to the, the, uh, the, the, um, the low sort of um, area detector. So the data rate dropped from 1.139 Megabit, uh, gigabit per second in a dark room to 1.122 gigabit in strong sunlight conditions. So that's a degradation of 1.5%. The larger detector, obviously, is a larger capacitor. The data rate is naturally smaller. So the, uh, the capacity, the data rate dropped from 416 uh, uh, megabit to about 396 megabit. That's a degradation of about 4.7%. So obviously, there's larger degradation because of the larger shot noise that's generated by the sunlight. But it's only shot noise that limits the process uh, in, the, in the, the SNR, but not the actual um, um, sunlight itself. It's, it's a, a signal that we filled out. So we think now, um, as an application, that like this, if you look into the ceiling, I don't know how many lights you have, but I would imagine you have at least 100. Uh, so you'd have 100 lights, and every single light is an access point, like a Wi-Fi access point, but in emitting light. Um, it is not possible to have uh, hundreds and 200 Wi-Fi access points in that room here because of the way the signals would interfere, and that would cause interference and then the uh, reduction of, of capacity of the system. But in a, in a, in a Li-Fi system, we can have this high density of transmitters, and we have looked into various sort of topologies um, and as you show, shown here, is um, with different tessellations. So we have a structured um, system with hexagonal cells, or we have square cells, or the more uh, recent uh, studies using a Poisson uh, point processes, so random processes to model uh, Li-Fi uh, systems where you usually don't control where the lights are. And they're purely random, and you create these sort of random cells. And the question now is, these black dots are users, 
and the red uh, circles are the access points, the question is how much interference would you get from neighboring lights because every light would carry independent data. Um, and the, uh, this interference would cause re a reduction in the signal-to-noise ratio or signal-to-noise plus interference ratio. And that has to be qualified and characterized. Um, and um, in a recent study where we have uh, looked into small cell femtocell networks with, with radio, and you see on the x-axis the bandwidth. Um, the, the, the good thing about uh, LIFI is if you have a channel, if your bandwidth of your device, like a micro LED, is 60 megahertz, your channel isn't 60 megahertz because you can modulate far beyond the 3 dB bandwidth using bit and power loading. And we don't have any spectrum masks as we have in radio where every channel is sort of regulated and the emission profile is very heavily regulated. So if you take this 60 megahertz and compare it to a, this is, um, is the, um, uh, the, um, the red line there, with a uh, system that uses radio, which is the blue lines, so the, the, the blue the solid line is the, the maximum femtocell capacity, and the dashed line is the, uh, the, the minimum. And if we compare the uh, one 500 megahertz Wi-Fi system with the Li-Fi system, so what we can get is using uh, micro LEDs, we can gain, in a system context, a capacity gain of 40 to 1,800 in terms of bit, bit per second per square meter. And that is a huge sort of gain uh, of using this sort of um, unlicensed bandwidth. So the applications, um, they, they are, um, in, in my view, one of, one of the most exciting things about LiFi because it, enters, it can enter all different sort of industry segments. If we go to now 5G cellular communication, because of that fact that I've introduced at the beginning, the higher path loss, the consequence is that the cell sizes have to shrink in addition to the need for beam forming. And the 5G community is now talking about cell size, size, uh, sizes of about 50 meter cell radius in 5G. Um, so in, they think of using street lamps as their transmitter, and the question is why can we not use the light in the street lamps as the uh, sort of high-speed wireless transmitter in the future. And in fact, it would also work when you dim the lights down to levels where the light would appear off. So it would also work during daytime. So we have the driverless car. We have the, uh, uh, the new automotive uh, industry where the, the, the car should not crash into lorries. So the car needs to have more, the driverless car, more sensing and more communication capabilities. <coughs> So actually, it is possible to use the headlight of a car and the taillight of a car to have communication between cars. You can also have, if you have solar panels in the roof of the light, you can use the street lamps to um, have an ex exchange of data from the car to the, the street furniture. So car to street furniture communication would be possible with that technology. Radio doesn't work underwater, but we have drones or remote operated vehicles working underwater capturing images and from the ground, and th there's a way to transmit data underwater also with, with light um, in, in, in high, at high speeds. We, we talk about new ways, and I mentioned the, the data-centric in, uh, industries, and one example is Industry 4.0, how they call it in Germany, or they call it sort of, um, uh, yeah, IoT, uh, Industry IoT, where you have lots of robots that need to be controlled by lots of data, and you don't want to have Wi-Fi doing that because the Wi-Fi wi signals go out of the manufacturing halls and can be intercepted fairly easily. And, and Wi-Fi is, per se, not a secure uh, sort of system. Light would stay within the manufacturing halls if you don't have windows. In addition, the high EMI, electromagnetic interference, would not interfere with any communication between these uh, machines. And obviously, the Internet of Things. If you imagine where you have LED lights at home, you have it in all your home appliances, in your fridges, in your ovens, in your microwaves, in, in everything, sometimes also in shoes. Uh, so wh why, why not, we can use, and I've shown you the, the one gigabit over 10 meter, why, why not use this sort of dumb light at a moment which only says on off and maybe standby, but we'll use it to transmit gigabits of data. That is really a way to have the enabler for smart systems. And then, um, the, the country I work at the moment, it's uh, the, in the, uh, sort of Great Britain, they have a big issue with the, with the health system. 
a big strain because uh, people stay too long in hospital beds. But now imagine you have a little sensor in your ear, captures uh, blood pressure, temperature, sugar levels, 24 hours, seven, seven days, and reports it to the intelligent systems that sits in the light. And then you can have patient monitoring um, very precisely because you can also do very precise indoor navigation with lights. And, and also you could find out if a person is lying or is it standing. So actually it's, it's a way of monitoring people, especially the aging society, quite, quite, quite well. And I, I mentioned indoor navigation, a, a wonderful example, and let me see applications in, in new ways of advertising where the, the lights in a shopping window provide sort of uh, new offers, uh, coupons and so on. In areas where you want to have uh, data access uh, in, in sports stadia, uh, for example, you want to have individualized replays of your favorite player, it doesn't work with Wi-Fi because of the high density of users, but Li-Fi would provide these additional bandwidth that would allow you new experiences in such environments. In intrinsically safe environments, you think about oil platforms, you think about uh, power plants, nuclear power plants, uh, big, big uh, sort of uh, submarines, um, the, uh, the antenna could, could for, for a radio system could create an explosion. Um, so it's not used, but light wouldn't be subject to this uh, um, uh, um, yeah, stress and, and could be used in these environments. And lastly, the IoT. Uh, the, the IoT is coming, but we, we see more and more reports that security is primarily the main issue about IoT. We have seen that um, people break into, into houses that are CCTV uh, um, camera sort of uh, surveyed through the IoT to the Bluetooth enabled uh, sort of camera at the front of the house. Uh, or you see car, uh, people breaking into cars, not via the, the door lock, but via the Bluetooth enabled car valve that measures the, the tire pressure. Uh, so security is a big, big issue. Uh, and especially in, in a hospital environment where your life sometimes depends on machines, you don't want to have anyone tampering with that machine. So you need to have secure communication, and Li-Fi provides this additional physical layer security. But not only that, it allows also um, higher, we have categorized five different layers of security that could be added. And then the, the vision is, at the moment, we talk about the internet, but actually 60% of the, the world's population do not have access to the internet. There's no way that people in, in sort of developing countries, all of them have internet access. And FSO systems, with, with, which are laser-based and very narrow beam-forming systems, are very expensive. But now imagine that they are expensive because you need beam tracking, and the, the receivers are sometimes of the size of a diameter of 8 to 10 centimeters. And due to atmospheric conditions, the beam diverge. But now imagine you have the, the size of a, of a roof with, uh, equipped with solar cells, Beam divergence actually is not a problem here anymore because the, the entire solar roof will capture all the photons that, that come into it. So we can create, and that's what we, we've been doing, uh, much more cost-sensitive FSO systems by using lasers in combination with solar panel receivers. And that is a way to bring the internet to remote areas and in, a, in a very cheap and affordable way. And lastly, what is very important, and uh, we work with a number of defense organizations, uh, LIFI provides vastly improved um, security and basically combines the security of fiber communication with the a, with a convenience of mobility. So really, it's, it's, if you talk about future wireless systems, you don't have to build millions and new radio access points. We can use the existing lighting infrastructure. And uh, we also, what we need to do is integrate little devices into smartphones. And if you followed the internet, there's been some people that seem to have hacked the iOS 9, um, 901 code. And you see the, the, the binary code there and the comments on the right. And uh, it's a comment that's written Li-Fi capability. Now, this has uh, created huge uh, rumors on the internet. And people are asking, is, is, is Apple now looking into Li-Fi? And uh, my company, PLIFI, we have partnered with a French lighting manufacturer, Lucibel, and they have brought out to the market in September last year the fully integrated LIFI Luminaire. Um, and um, the, the market reports that you see is that uh, a forecast of hundreds of billion uh, dollar industry in, in the next um, five to, to five years. So let, let me now finish my talk. I have a few more minutes. 
with some commercial uh, consideration, considerations. We have the incandescent light bulb is phasing out, and that is a very good thing because we save a lot of energy. But it also has a negative implication for the lighting industry, and you've seen that uh, happen now that Philips Lighting sort of spun, uh, is sort of um, spun off of Philips as an independent company now floating in the stock market after 123 years is because the business model of selling light bulbs has changed. And it's, it's, it's that. After 123 years, Philips, is now, Philips Lighting is an own company. And the reason is that is that LED lights last 20 years and longer. So they last longer than your car, and uh, the industry would not sell lights as it sold lights before. And the implication to that industry is perhaps similar to the photography industry when the CMOS sensors came in. Uh, the analog photography industry, like Kodak, they all suffered heavily because they didn't realize what it meant for the industry. And this industry is also going through a similar uh, change. Where change has huge opportunities. And the opportunities I've tried to highlight here is, if you think about it, the lighting industry was governed by a metric is, is sort of number of light bulbs sold, or dollars per light bulb. It is going into this phase of light as a service, which is the, the governing metric is dollars per lumen. So you provide, uh, the, there's companies providing illumination as they provide gas and electricity. But it's taking, life will take it further to a metric that's called um, sort of dollar per bit. What that means is the business opportunities in the lighting industry now are that they can expand their markets into the classic areas of the, the wireless communications industry. And there is no reason why a lighting company cannot sell communications equipment in the future. They enter, they can grab some of the market share of the classic wireless communications industry. And obviously, uh, that will probably not be left unresponded by that industry because there is this, uh, this shortage of a spectrum, the wireless communication need to in expand, despite the huge investment into RF. They need to expand into the new spectrum domains, and the push will be through 5G and IoT in that domain, and the, the pull, I call it from the lighting industry, will be uh, through light as a service, and there will be one unified industry that is governed by one single metric dollars per bit. And that transition and that uh, disruption, I would call it, is, is through, through Li-Fi. And it is a bit um, like laying new rail tracks for this new century of uh, economic um, development, and the carriers are the applications that run on these Li-Fi rail tracks. Uh, last comparison is if um, the, 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 the mobile phone, and I still can remember the brick. Um, how many services did a mobile phone that time cover? It's one. And by accident, too, SMS was a, an engineering accident. Uh, and now the smartphone, it, it serves thousands of applications. So it's a multi-service device. And uh, that, that had, had created a huge success. Now, this thing here, um, how many services does an incandescent light bulb serve? Again, two, heat and light. It will change, the heat will go, and in the future we'll have computers microprocessors in, embedded into lighting devices with an operating system and, and, and Li-Fi that basically modulates the light in addition to providing lighting. So that device in the future can be programmed via SDN-enabled networks, and it can deliver the Internet of Things in your manufacturing halls, in your homes, in your offices, in your streets, everywhere. And uh, that brings me to my last slide, and I have uh, 30 seconds um, on time. So the, the vision really is, is in the future that all, all the, the capacities and the, the gigabits that we've seen from the previous speakers, the way we, we talk about in a, in a fiber optic domain, in, in a few years from now we talk about the same gigabits and hundreds of gigabits in the wireless domain connecting our cities, connecting our environments, and to really unlock uh, this new tremendous uh, economic growth by, enabled by connectivity. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention.